a good morning. I want to mention before we get into the message this morning, we have uh, added a little additional tool to our outreach toolbox. We had some little cards created. Uh, Amy designed these for us. We appreciate her good work on that. But um, has uh, basic information about the church on one side and a QR code that takes people to our website on the back if you want to have some of these to hand to people, to leave on tables, whatever it is uh, um, that you might want to do. There are some as you leave on the, the table in a little, um, little basket and we want you to know that we have those and encourage you to to spread the good word about the church and and use those profitably. The writer of the the longest chapter in all the Bible, Psalm 119, right in the midst of that great psalm of 176 verses, in verse 97 he paused to say this to God. He he wrote Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Now, it took me some time in my life to, uh, to really agree with that with all my heart. But I believe that I can safely say I do. I love the Word of God. When I was in college, the Bible professor who set me on this course in life said something one time that I just didn't really understand at the time he said it, but I think I do now. We were talking, it was either before or after class that day, just some of us Bible students and, and Dr. Warden, and one of the students asked him, what TV show do you like to watch, Dr. Warden? And I can hear his answer and the way he said it um, to this day, clear as a bell, even though at the time my, my 18-year-old ears didn't understand or appreciate what he said and didn't for many years. We asked him, you know, what TV show do you like to watch? And, and he said, I, I don't watch much TV at all, fellas. I get more pleasure reading one of Paul's letters of an evening than I do anything I watch on TV. Now, none of us understood what he said, really. We couldn't relate to it. He may have well have been speaking Greek, which, in fact, he went on to teach some of us how to, how to read eventually through the years. But that has always stuck with me through the years uh, that this man that I developed such respect for over time preferred the company and entertainment of the Word of God in the evening than anything that Hollywood could produce. Now, I'd be far from honest if I said that I don't watch TV or spend any time on, on social media or any of the distractions that, that we have these days, but I think I have learned and appreciated more and more over time what he was trying to say to us by his answer. And I hope that my love for the word shows through. And I hope your love for the word is increasing all the time. I really do. Now, I don't want to be a Christopher Columbus preacher this morning. So let me get right to it. You ever heard Christopher Columbus preach? No? You know, Columbus... Uh, Remember that when Columbus started out, he didn't know where he was going. And, and when he got there, he didn't know where he was. And then when he came back, he didn't know where he had been. <laughs> so here's where we're going. We are called as the people of God to consume the word of God. To internalize it, to taste it to swallow it, to chew it, to gnaw on it, to enjoy it, to savor it, to digest it, to 
assimilate it, to metabolize it, however you want to say it. It's more than just reading it. So you're never going to hear me say, read your Bible and just leave it at that. No, it's not what we're called to do. There is more to it than just reading it. I want to draw your attention this morning to a chapter in the book of Revelation, last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 10. We're going to be spending some time in the book of Revelation in coming, uh, in coming weeks, not on this particular theme so much, but we're going to camp out in Revelation some uh, in this last book of the Bible. This morning, though, Revelation chapter 10. John is in the midst of a, a magnificent vision that God is giving him. And when we come to chapter 10, we are in the section where these, there are these angels, seven of them, and they keep stepping forward and blowing a trumpet. And when they blow the trumpet, each time they do... The wrath of God, the anger of God, in some form or, or other, crashes down upon the earth. This is what John sees in his vision. And so an angel steps forward, blows a trumpet, something terrible happens on the earth. Uh, one time there's hail, another time fire, um, mountains are moved, there are stars falling out of the sky, the lights of the heavens go out. There are horrible creatures described that crawl out of the, the fiery bottomless pit and torment the people on the earth. There's a, a gigantic cavalry invasion that leads to the death of, of one-third of the population of the planet at the sound of one of these trumpets. So all these awful torments sent by the wrathful God to get the attention of those who live on earth as if to say, hey, I'm here. Repent. Turn to me. But as the vision is described, all these attempts fail. The people who survive what happens, they don't repent they continue to, to bow down to their idols. They continue to murder one another, practice their dark arts. They continue to rip one another off. They continue to indulge in sexual immorality. It's a way of seeing really the history of mankind in a vision because that stuff, no matter what happens on the earth, still goes on. And then in chapter 10, before the seventh and final trumpet is blown by the angel, we have this little interlude. There's this pause in, in the madness of all this apocalyptic tumult that is being poured out on the earth. I want us to read beginning in verse 1 of chapter 10 a, a part of this. Just notice what happens here. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and called out with a loud voice, like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded, and when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled just as he announced to his servants 
the prophets. Now pause there a minute in our reading of Revelation 10. Did you notice that in the middle of that, John wanted to stop and write? John wanted to write down what was going on. Check it out there in verse 4. So he's receiving this incredible revelation from the Lord, and he just had to write it down, he felt. God tells him, no, don't write it down. When I look at the uh, religion section in the bookstore, or, or more likely these days on Amazon, I wish more people listened to God on this. There's an old line that with some authors, you know, they, they have no unpublished opinions. And it's, it's, it's as true as ever. And I think I know why the writer of Ecclesiastes, for example, sort of lamented this. In these words, he said, of the making of books, there is no end, and much study of them is a weariness of the flesh. So what's a man like John supposed to do? He's all revved up by the revelation of God, and he's got no place to go, no book to write. God told him, don't write. Well, look on with me. Revelation 10 continues, verse 8. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. Interesting part of the word of God. What is John supposed to do? He's told... Eat this book, this scroll, verse 9. So John stands in a long line of prophets that were told to do this very thing. Um, Jeremiah was told to do this. Ezekiel was told to do this. Basically, eat this book. Every once in a while I hear preachers say they want to be prophets. They, they want to preach prophetically. And, and I guess that's okay as long as, as long as I understand what it actually means to be a prophet. Being a prophet usually means a short, unhappy life. Prophets get killed for what they say. God asks prophets to do weird things, to do awful things, horrendous things at times. Being a, a prophet of the Lord is not pleasant. In fact, it's often ugly. John's a prophet. So John the prophet, who, who wrote down this, this vision, think about where he was when he did so. Where was John? He is in exile. If you read the entire book carefully, John is in exile on a small rocky island. Why is he there? Because he wouldn't shut up about Jesus. He wouldn't quit preaching Christ. So he is in exile. He is isolated on this rocky island. He is away from family and friends and the church that he worked in with he is totally isolated from the world because he was being so influential in teaching people about Jesus the government shut him down and sent him away no one today who says they want to be a prophet means anything like that you see 
John is told, eat this book. And he's told, it's not going to be pleasant. It's going to make you sick at your stomach. Now, how many of us, when we think about doing a daily Bible reading program, I know several of you are doing that, right now but how many of us when when we when we do that or maybe when we encourage others to do that inform them that they're not going to like it not a real good way to get people to do something to tell them this is going to make you sick sometimes you know hey i want you to do this thing but you're not going to like it not a good commercial is it how how many would, would tell people that if they read the book right, they're not going to feel so good at times when they read it. You know, if you're willing to speak that truth to people, or a preacher is willing to speak that truth to a church, that's prophetic preaching. Uh, do it sometimes, see, see what happens. Eat this book. Before you write about it, eat it. Before you opine, dine. Consume the word of God. Internalize it, taste it, swallow it, chew it, gnaw on it, enjoy it, savor it, digest it, metabolize it, assimilate it. Get this book inside of you, into your soul. Don't just read your Bible. That's not good enough. Never has been. Bible reading is for Bible worshipers. God doesn't want Bible worshipers. He wants God worshipers. This image in Revelation 10 teaches us that we need to feed on Scripture. Scripture is designed to nourish us and sustain us like food does the body. And sometimes we eat food that doesn't taste that great. Jesus' most controversial sermon. We often talk about the great preacher that Jesus was, and he was the greatest. We often talk about his great sermons, and he had great ones, but we don't talk a lot about his most controversial sermon. Do you know, do you know what that was? Jesus' most controversial sermon was, in fact, when he applied this very idea to himself that we're talking about this morning. Yes, Jesus preached prophetically, and you remember how that all ended, right? They killed him for it. And when Jesus preached this particular sermon that I'm referring to, you know what happened to his audience? It didn't grow. It was decimated. Go read about it. John chapter 6. That's where it's recorded. And check out there. It's a long chapter. But take some time to read it and see what a real prophet sounds like. Just a couple of quotes from it. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Now, that doesn't seem so controversial. We like that idea. We often reference that, don't we, when, when we take the Lord's Supper. I am the bread of life, he said. But he also said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. And he said, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Now we've come to understand that, hopefully. But imagine being the first one to hear that sermon. You know how that audience responded? They said, we can't listen to this anymore. We can't hear this anymore. And you know what Jesus said? 
He said, most of you never believed in me anyway. That's a prophet. And indeed, most of the people that heard it turned back and no longer walked with him. Sometimes Jesus' sermons eliminated his audience because they contain the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. He is the word of God, and we need to eat this book. That's what I want you to hear this morning. We need to internalize it, taste it, swallow it, chew it, savor it, digest it, assimilate it, and metabolize it. When we do that, and when we overcome the stomach upset that sometimes results, because there's going to be things in it we don't want to hear, that address us and who we are and who we need to be, when we overcome that stomach upset that it will inevitably cause, it will indeed shape us and transform us. True leaders of God's word become what they read. It is absolutely true, spiritually, that you are what you eat. And I want to do everything I can to encourage you to become true readers of the word of God. Psalm 34 verse 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's bow together. Holy God, thank you for communicating with us, for sending us your Son, who is your Word, and for giving us a record of that in these pages that sit before us this morning. Help us to consume it and let it change us help us to be faithful readers help us to eliminate distractions that vie for our attention and would pull us away from your truth and we are just surrounded by them Thank you for your love and concern for us and for salvation that comes through the word of God, the word made flesh. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. This morning, as we conclude, we offer a time where you might come and, and ask for prayers, for help, encouragement. You might make a new commitment to the Lord or a first commitment. You might obey his gospel be baptized into Christ for forgiveness of sins. If we can help you with anything like that or, or some other need we haven't mentioned in, in these moments, please come. Let us know what it is. Walk together we stand and sing. Oh, to Jesus, I